Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear and see us well. Uh, welcome to our um, Life After Pooms Dentistry in the UK event. Um, I will just like to thank everybody for joining and I hope that this will be an informative session for you and that um, it proves to be useful. So I'm just going to start by passing it over to Dr. Hashmi and yeah, he'll get started with the presentation. I hope you guys enjoy it. Hi guys, uh, I hope you can all hear me properly. If, if you can't, just message in the comments. Uh, my name's uh, Maran or Ali, um, as everyone calls me in Pumps. Uh, I graduated from Pumps in 2019 and then I went straight into oral maxillofacial surgery in the UK. Um, and I haven't really kind of been much in general practice, but I have kind of uh, put my toes into it. Um, essentially, what I'm going to be doing uh, through this kind of webinar is kind of going through the new changes in uh, registering as a dentist in the UK and also discussing pathways that you can take um, as a career in the UK as a dentist or if you want to go into oral maxillofacial surgery um, because it's quite uh, quite daunting and it's quite different and it's it's very hard to kind of navigate yourself through the process because there's so much red tape more so than actual colon to be honest um, and because of Brexit now, things have got a bit more complicated and uh, a bit more, um, let's say, unreasonable from, from the General Dental Council point of view, um, as I've seen this week. Um, so yeah, um, let's go ahead. If you can go to the next slide. Awesome. Thank you. So beforehand, uh, when I graduated and the people before, like the year before me graduated, we found a little uh, loophole uh, in the licensing um, pathway into the UK. So the way that licensing in any European country works is that there is something called the EU Directive of Qualifications, and that is the basis in which you can apply uh, into a certain country uh, using a degree from another European country. Um, the directive is basically the sole um, guidance that any country has on what is required by another country um, for their graduates to register, register in their own country. Um, so when you take a Polish degree, there's requirements which are have been added on over the past uh, two, three weeks um, post-Brexit, which are, are relatively um, not impossible to, to obtain, but very, very difficult uh, to get because a uh, majority of European countries having a degree is good enough to get your license, whereas in Poland, they've added on something into the EU directive which says that you need to have one year of uh, postgraduate internship in Poland, as well as passing the LDEC exam. Now, the LDEC exam is difficult as it is. Um, it's not an impossible exam, and I know people who've passed it um, in their first attempts or their second attempts. Um, but what is unreasonable is the issue of internship. Now, to do a full year internship, which is what the General Dental Council is saying is required, um, if you go to the next slide, I think I've, I've added the email. Yeah, so so basically what they're asking for is that you need to pass this exam and you also need to do one year of internship. Now, currently, as it current, currently stands in, in Poland, English students can only do six months. And uh, the, the thought was that the universities could sign you off for a year. But a lot for our university, for example, isn't necessarily doing that. And when you do obtain your, your six months and you've got your LDEC and you go to the UK and say like, look, I want to register as a dentist now, they're refusing the applications on the basis that it's six months short from what they're asking for. So that leaves uh, students in a, in a bit of a situation, especially students who are from the UK or were planning to go to the UK after graduation. And the, the primary loopholes that we found is that now Dean, Dean Justina, who's in charge of the dentistry program for English students, has been made aware of this. She's trying to figure out a way that uh, students can be signed off for that entire duration by kind of meeting the checklist. So the way that these internships usually work is that there's a checklist of things you need to accomplish through the year. Can that be compressed into um, six months and can all the competencies be signed off for the year essentially, meaning that you've technically done your internship for a year? She's currently working on that. And for current fifth year students, she will be um, getting in touch with you guys soon uh, and getting a list of students who would be interested so that she can arrange this for you. 
However, for the, year, the years after this, it's going to be an issue um, because uh, this, this internship or English internship thing will be removed. The only other way to get an internship after next year would be to pass the uh, Polish language exam and then um, applying for an intern position inside the, the Stoma uh, in Pumps, which is, which is a very unrealistic expectation, especially if you're someone like me. Uh, I, I can't speak Polish. I lived in Poland for five years and I, 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 my Polish is crap. Um, but it's not impossible. Um, there's a, a few girls that I know from my class who had no, un, no uh, competency in Polish whatsoever. They didn't know the Polish language, but over the course of the year, um, they picked up the language really fast. And one of them is even fully licensed as a, as a dentist in, in Poland. And she can literally go to any EU country that she wants now. So it's not something that's impossible, but it's very, very difficult. And I think that as students, you need to be aware of that. And if you're in the younger years, you need to prepare yourself for that. So make sure that you are picking up um, as much of the Polish language as possible because you don't know how things are going to change um, over the coming years. And that being said, there is an alternative route that students can take, um, which was kind of pioneered by one of the students two years above me. Um, Portugal has some private universities. Now, Portugal is one of the universities that the UK uh, will recognize automatically, as well as other EU countries. So every EU country will recognize a Polish, uh, sorry, a Portuguese dentistry qualification as an automatic registration, meaning you don't need to do the language exams. You don't need to do uh, any additional um, internship or anything of the sort. So the, the Portuguese route is looking very likely as being the, the most secure way to get your registration in the UK if that's where you want to go. Um, I think uh, my brother, uh, who's in fifth year, Abbas, has contact with the, the agent who kind of deals with transferring all your credits to the Portuguese system so that you can get into the final year of studies there. Um, so I would, uh, I'll add a link into the presentation later on where you can contact him and, and see if, if that would be a viable option for you um, to go forward. It just offers a bit more kind of flexibility because you're not, you wouldn't just be tied into the UK. You could literally go to Ireland, uh, Norway, Sweden, anywhere you like, because if, if Poland has changed these rules now, I'm pretty sure the countries are going to reciprocate on, on those changes. Um, but that's something we need to kind of keep an eye on and hopefully I can just provide updates to the DSA and IBSG as we go along and they can uh, provide those to you. And the only reason I kind of keep an eye on these type of things is because uh, I do teach it uh, or I'm supposed to start teaching at POMS in the near future uh, with some courses with Brannon and uh, some other graduate students. But let's see how that goes. Um, but yeah, this is an e the, the previous thing was an email from the GDC just confirming that. And I sent this email in five different ways to get the, the, to see if they would kind of give you a different answer because the GDC are very much like that. And uh, they don't give you a straight up response. They'll kind of just give you a text, text copy and paste message. But in every single message that I've sent, they've given me the same response. And uh, I've spoken to them multiple times and they have, they're completely um, firm on the fact that you know, you need a one year internship and you need to have uh, the other thing. The other alternative actually to go through the UK uh, is to do something called the Oversea Registration Exam, which is the ORE, uh, which is in two parts. First part is theoretical and second part is um, practical. Now, this exam is not only very, very expensive, it's very, very difficult and it's got a very low passing, uh, passing mark in a sense. Um, from what I know, it takes people an average of two years to get through the system or to get through these exams. And once you are finished these exams, you're still expected to do a one year uh, placement in foundation training, um, which I'll get onto later. Um, and after that, only can you start practicing as an associate and kind of work in general practice in the way that you want to or specialize in a sense. The other exam which was introduced uh, not too long ago is called the LDS. Um, which is a, li a license of dental surgery, um, which is run by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Now the LDS is a way, way, way better exam with uh, better prospects in terms of um, getting into your career and getting into your working life faster. The only issue with this exam is it's ballot based, meaning that there will be a period um, within the year 
that you would need to register for this exam. And then you would randomly be selected out of thousands of people to be able to take the first part of this exam. Um, so it's quite a difficult thing to get into, but if you're lucky enough to be accepted, it's, it's more easier than the ORE pathway and you could be expecting to work after a year. Um, unlike the ORE where it would be up to two to three years. But yeah, that's it on, in terms of registering, uh, specific things you can ask me at the end, um, and I'll be more than happy to kind of go over like the details of things. Uh, but yeah, if you can go to the next slide, perfect. So say hypothetically, you've got your, your registration inside the UK. Now there's two pathways that essentially you can take. The, uh, the first pathway is uh, dental vocational training or, an, or as in England, they call it dental foundation training. This is a one year um, internship, let's call it that, uh, where you kind of go over every basic competency in dentistry and uh, you get introduced to things called audits and all these other things, which I'll go over later. Um, essentially, you're, you're kind of mentored directly um, by a dentist who's been practicing, I think, for about more than four to five years. Um, they teach you the basic fundamental things that you need to do from basic examinations to treatment planning uh, to like coordinating with other specialties uh, and kind of creating comprehensive dental uh, plans and evaluations. Um, they're also kind of like your one-to-one -one clinical tutor. Um, so if you get stuck on something or you need help with something, they're literally usually the, next, the, the door next door um, and they'll come in and help you or they can like take over and show you how things are done. Um, they also do once a week have um, uh, kind of like seminars and, and workshops and things like one-to-one -one training with you uh, and you cover a range of different topics. It could be like composite fillings, it could be something in endodontics, it can be extractions, it can be anything. Um, and essentially they monitor you over that year and then they sign you off. And when you're signed off, you get this kind of um, certificate which allows you to get something which is called a performer number in the NHS. Now, performer number, to put it very simply in the NHS, is like having a contract number uh, where you can practice dentistry publicly. Um, and the whole point, purpose of the Dental Foundation training is to give you um, the backing to say that you are competent enough to practice dentistry safely uh, in the public. So the foundation training for EU graduates is not required. It's not a compulsory requirement. But if you want to be a good dentist and you don't want to lose... Uh, your uh, registration within your first year, you really need to do it. And I would highly recommend this to anyone who wants to come into the UK um, if they know that they're gonna pass an exam or they have the feeling that they've passed an exam, you should apply for this training anyway. It happens, the, the applications I think open up uh, around or before October, um, usually just after summer, every single year. So if you're going through the exams or you're going through the Portuguese route, you should sign up for this uh, or kind of apply for um, shortlisting onto this program. And uh, you'll have to do something called the situational judgment exam, which will test your clinical aptitude, not clinical aptitude, your behavior and your um, reactions to certain scenarios and situations. Exactly, basically what it means, the situational judgment exam. Um, and then after you've done that from next year, the interviews will be reintroduced. So you'll be interviewed by someone and they'll give you like a case that you need to go through. And basically they're assessing your thinking. They're not assessing your clinical competency because they realize that you've just graduated and that's something that you're going to have to build up during that training period. But what they want to see is how you react to certain situations and how you process problems uh, because that's important as a dentist. And then essentially at the end of this like mini interview type of process, they'll rank you. And there's like hundreds of programs across uh, the entire country that you can apply to um, on a ranking based system. And the scores that you get from your interview in SJT will be the deter determining factor of where you end up. If you want to go to London, you need to be pretty much like the top 10% of the entire applicant pool uh, in terms of score. And that's the sole way of uh, ranking in the system. But yeah, that's dental vocational training. So the pathway is there kind of written down and um, of course it's going to be updated so i'll probably provide a, a comprehensive kind of like 
um, PowerPoint to you all that you can kind of follow and read through uh, as well as some additional uh, reading material for you. Um, the other pathway, so this is hospital-based dentistry. They call it dental core training. Traditionally, the way that the system works in the UK is that you do your foundation training in your first year. And then while you're doing your foundation training, around January time, end of January, start of February, you apply for something called dental core training. Now, dental core training is either hospital-based dentistry or subspecialist dentistry or community dentistry. So again, you have a trainer, you have an educational supervisor for that entire year, and you're working at a more kind of comprehensive and more advanced level than you were the previous year. Um, when I, I started working, when I graduated, essentially I took on a locum dental core training position in oral maxillofacial surgery, which is completely hospital based. So it's like, you're literally playing doctor the, the entire year and you're pretty much always out of your debt, but you kind of pick up uh you're through the training and through the education that you get through that year on how to kind of uh suture lacerations deal with like advanced dental traumas and, and facial fractures and these type of things uh, but that being said dental core training has other kind of uh, pathways as well you could do things in community dentistry so dealing with patients who have high needs and high dependencies um so kind of you learn how to do sedation you learn how to um work and gain compliance with patients who are otherwise very very difficult to deal with um, you're also kind of dealing with uh, situations where you um, are performing kind of comprehensive treatment plans for patients who are advancing medi uh, medically um, compromised so you kind of work well with all the other specialties and things and to be honest i think that that's a really good pathway for you if you want to be working in the NHS as a dentist in the long term because the experiences that you probably gain from that will kind of help you significantly through your your public dental career um, because a lot of dentists tend not to touch patients who have high medical or, or are otherwise medically compromised or have high dependent needs uh, because they're very very difficult to deal with and very difficult to treat and if you could kind of crack that little code and, and incorporate that into your dental, your general dental practice, you, you'd literally uh, be laughing and you wouldn't have to depend on other people to help you with that type of thing. So dental core training is kind of that pathway where you can learn all of these like niche skills or these very uh, useful skills. And a lot of people have started to take this, especially during the COVID period. It was the first year last year where, um, there were not enough dental core training positions and trust me there's probably more than excess of 400 positions or something um, and they didn't have any positions for even the uk grads um, but that being said uh, this is something that you could apply into as a locum like i said that i, I applied and as a locum just after graduation the locums are very very competitive though um, when I applied uh, first, uh, the first time I applied, there were 60 applicants or something, and they're only looking for one person and one spot. So you really need to kind of build a portfolio and have a good, uh, uh, like kind of reference in terms of work experience that you've done in that field. And you need to kind of prove that you know what you're doing because in oral maxillofacial surgery, it's just, it, it's insane. It's from the get-go, you're kind of thrown into the deep end and you're expected to deal with these people or like, either half their faces are missing or they've got complex um, cancers and uh, you kind of need to know exactly what you're doing. Um, so again, while you're in dental school, the top tip that I can give you and that I wish I kind of followed through a bit more with, uh, despite um, my like kind of alumni who were in the years above me telling me about this is that build yourself work experience in the relative field that you expect to go to uh, in the future. Whether you do that at home, whether you do that in pumps, try to do something at least that will kind of help you uh, gain a stronger insight into the eventual pathway that you want to go to. I know people say go into general practice and decide afterwards, but I think that's a bad mentality you have to have because you see the difference between the people who've kind of made up their minds at the beginning um, on where they want to end up and the people who kind of decide in between. That being said, it's not a problem, it's not an issue, but it will help you a lot better in terms of getting into that specialty if that's what you want to do eventually. But yeah, next. So working as a dentist in the UK, there's um, 
specific things that you need to be aware of. And as a graduate myself, regardless of what country you want to go to, I would, ex I would highly recommend that you start using guidelines um, as you go into your clinical years and use the guidelines of the country that you're eventually going to want to go back to. For me, it's, it was NICE guidelines, which are um, uh, NICE guidelines, SDSEP, Royal College, and NHS guidelines in a sense. So basically, these are comprehensive um, guidance on what you should do in certain clinical scenarios or clinical situations. And a lot of it, or no, nearly all of it actually, is evidence-based. So you only get the kind of uh, the best of the, the, the information that's out there uh, in terms of how to deal with something. Uh, for example, the other day I had a, a kid, this, this is a very basic situation, but uh, there was a kid who had an evolved tooth which had been out for more than five hours and it was in milk, so it was a physiological storage medium. Um, it, you know, this is his permanent teeth, his two permanent incisors, uh, central incisors, and most likely I would just reimplant them and then just place a, a kind of a, a splint on it to see if it can, could kind of heal. But the guidelines kind of give you that um, that kind of backing to make clinical justifications and also provide you with the information that you need to kind of explain to the patient's parents, for example, like there's a really poor prognosis for this type of thing. And you can kind of give them the specifics of why that's the case. And it's one thing reading through textbooks and kind of gaining, get, kind of gathering that information in your head and being able to kind of describe that to patients when you're 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 um meeting with it but it's another thing to have guidance which tells you these are the things you specifically need to mention these are specific problems that you need to kind of uh describe to the patient and their their family or something because if you don't basically you could get litigated and you you could get sued and not just get sued you could get taken to the gdc however because you have these guidelines you have a baseline and with that baseline you could kind of use that as your justification to why you've done something um, and this is and I, I wish I used this more while I was in dental school because the more you use them and the more you get used to things the more your uh, clinical direction or clinical understanding will kind of develop um, you're not just stuck with things that you've learned in your exam or you or your kind of teachers told you but you're doing things properly and efficiently in the way that they kind of should be or the way that the evidence suggests that it should be done. Um, and you also kind of get into that habit of constantly checking and constantly updating yourself on that too. Um, now things, uh, the next thing is audits. Now audits um, are a very special thing in the UK. If you're a dentist in the UK, you need to do an audit. If you, can't, if you don't do an audit, essentially, you could pretty much be in danger of losing your, your registration with the GDC because it is a core requirement. Now an audit is, assessing the quality of something or assessing um, the um, kind of, uh, let's just say, ref or reflecting on something, um, a specific topic or a specific uh, problem that's occurring. And basically, you, for example, I think an example would be better. Uh, assessing the quality of radiographs is a very common audit that's done. So all the radiographs that you're taking or all the radiographs that are being processed in your clinic you essentially will uh, gather the the gather information on how good was the quality. Um, were you able to kind of get all the information you needed from that radiograph? And uh, the third thing would be how you improved. Now you're doing this over a range of of, uh, of different radiographs, say like over 100, 150. Um, and then at the end, basically, you compile all this information, you click, create this, this report or this presentation on uh, the, the range or the scope of things that have been done and how you can improve it. And essentially, that's what the GDC call as self, as called self-reflection. So in every single kind of um, aspect of dentistry, you can hold an audit. And that's a great way to hold yourself accountable um, on improvement and improving your quality of practice and also improving the quality of practice uh, of the people around you as well so those are those are, are are great because otherwise i feel like a lot of people become stagnated and they kind of stick to the same thing which was why audits were kind of introduced and um, a lot of people who have like 20 30 years of experience in a certain field would want to would rather continue doing things that way that they usually do it rather than improve 
So this audit process is essentially a way to kick them into new habits and uh, constant reflection and constant change. Um, tied to that is CPD requirements. Now, if you don't know what CPD is, it's clinical uh, uh, clinical pressure, professional development. I, I can't even remember what it what it means, but yeah, it's basically professional development. Uh, courses or programs or anything of the sort which keeps you um, in the loop with the current know-how in terms yeah continuing professional development thank you Brandon sorry um, and essentially um, in the UK you have I think it's about 20 uh, hours compulsory uh, CPD per year um, the this covers stuff like medical emergencies it covers um, any any education that would be relevant to your current scope of practice. Um, and basically, this is another way to encourage you to keep on studying and keep on researching and keep on kind of developing on your, uh, your competencies, your dental competencies. Um, but I mean, you could get CPD on things like accounting and, and management of, you know, your dental business and things as well. So it's not just limited to dentistry, it could kind of re things related to it as well. But that just keeps you kind of going as well. Um, the other thing is indemnity. Now, indemnity is like your legal protection. Um, every country has a, a somewhat of an, a requirement. But in the UK, if you do not have indemnity set up before you start practice, you'll basically lose your registration because it shows that you're not responsible enough to, um, to or, or sorry, not professional enough or, or my, not too familiar with the, the, the way that it would work, but it, it's the fact that um, if it's a legal requirement that you need to kind of legally protect yourself and you're not following that, um, they believe that you're not um, being professional. And that's the way that they would litigate and take away your registration in a sense. And um, you're also putting patients at risk by not having indemnity as well, because if you do something wrong, and they try to sue you, you could just kind of like declare um, bankruptcy or whatever you want to do and not have to pay out. So it kind of protects patients in a sense, um, as well as yourself. So if you do get sued, they would pay out as well. Um, other thing is um, very, very, very important because I didn't know how to do notes when I was in pumps. But if you do any, if you do not record all of the things that you're supposed to record, like you're supposed to do an extra oral examination, you're supposed to do an intra oral examination you're supposed to do your bpe among other stuff uh while you're you're doing an exam if you're not covering all of those check boxes and say somebody complains to you one day uh a complaint against you one day um the gdc will go back five six years and find one case with one patient out of the thousands of patients you've seen and say that you did not do say um a proper extra oral examination you did not palpate the lymph nodes or you didn't do a proper check of the, the, the periodontal status of that patient. And based off of that one patient, they will suspend you. So start gaining really good habits while you're in university. Even if your clinical supervisor doesn't care about your note taking or anything, get yourself a notepad, get yourself a template on things that you should really be looking out for when you're doing a basic clinical exam and start doing it. You need to build your habits while you're in university. There's no point thinking that I'm just going to go through dental school as the status quo. And then afterwards, I'll start to, to pick things up when I start working. It, it's, believe me, any graduate will tell you it's the worst thing that you can do because you've already built up those bad habits over the, the course of the three years that you've been in clinics. And now you're working in practice and you have to build these new habits, but you've already kind of built that, that stubbornness inside you where you don't want to do it, but you have to. So start, start taking notes while you're in thing. And this doesn't matter which country you, you go to because every country is the same and has the same kind of rules as well. Um, when we're talking about general practice, I think that, you know, don't, do not be afraid to make mistakes in dental school. And uh, make every mistake that you, uh, not, I'm not telling you to make mistakes, but I'm telling you that do not, kind of hesitate when you're getting involved in something. I mean, half the time when I was in dental school, when I was in my fifth year, teacher would be like, who wants to do this? And I'd just be like sitting in the back with the rest of the guys, like, yeah, I'm not, I'll just let someone else do it. But take the risk, you do it. Even if you're, you feel like you're gonna embarrass yourself, it doesn't make a difference. It's a whole learning experience. I mean, majority of the time, the person who's probably volunteered, who's had the, like the guts to, to volunteer and do it, 
is probably going to make a mistake. But honestly, they're going to be way better off than you would be because they've experienced a mistake first on hand with the first on hand experience. So um, definitely don't be afraid to do that um, and always try to push yourself into the deep end um, because I feel like that's the best way to become a good dentist is to kind of surround yourself with the difficult stuff at the beginning. And dental school is the best place to do that. Um, that being said, I think that um, kind of tying this back in with, with UK practice, as long as you can always justify when you've made a mistake, as long as you can justify that you've learned from that mistake, you will always be supported, whether it be from the NHS or whether it be from the, the General Dental Council, even if they're coming after you for not doing VPP, if you, for, for not doing periodontal probing, for example, which is a common thing to get uh, litigated for. As long as you can indicate or show to them that you have done CPD or you've changed your ways or you're willing to kind of accept that you were wrong and you're going to kind of move on uh, in a more positive and more um, in a proper way, they will always kind of tend to support you. But if you're always stubborn and being like, oh, you know, that was just one off mistake, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're definitely going to take your license away because you can't accept that you were wrong. And the the GDC will always say that they're right and everyone else is wrong. So, yeah, uh, that that's important to know. Um, yeah, I think that should be be it. I'm not sure. Could you try the next slide and see if there's anything there? I can't even remember what I put on here. I don't think there is a slide. Yeah. So I think. Um, I've talked enough. Um, I think that it would be better for us to do a Q&A. Um, there is uh, another graduate, which I think quite a lot of you might know of, uh, Brannon, um, who is a associate dentist, actually a clinical, uh, he's got his own clinic at the moment um, in, um, in England. Uh, and he's going to join me for like a little Q&A. He's got comprehensive experience uh, in kind of the general practice setting more than I would. He's also got oral maxillofacial experience, but it would be good to have him kind of help answer your questions as well. So um, we can start, at, go ahead with the Q and A if you like. I'm just gonna check the, the chat and see if I can see the question. Is, is Brown in there? I think he should be. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Yeah, hey, Brandon. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Dude, I just woke up. So, yeah, sorry, everyone. I just woke up, by the way, because I was on night. So, I, I look on that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so is there any questions or anything um, at all? I can't even see them. How do I find it? If you guys have questions, you can unmute yourself to ask, or you can type in the chat if you'd rather do that instead. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I see it now. Um, oh, questions. Okay. Uh, so um, MJ is asking, what if you do bad on the vocational training? Is there any way to get better result or work in a better city? Um, I think you would know more about that, Brandon, because of in terms the of people um, that you know. If you bad in what? In, in vocational training. So you know the DFT. Like yeah. I, cause, because we do know some someone who did it, um, and I know a few people who've also uh, done foundation training and they've they've struggled through it. Um, but if you want, Brian, you can start, and then I could just give some input. Do you think they mean by a bad rank? Um, I think they mean by what if you do bad during the vocational training. So you know when you're in the the foundation year. I'll be honest; it's not really possible to do bad. Yeah. Um, it's only possible to do bad if you just don't know dentistry. Now, if yeah. I, I trust if you're on this, on this presentation, then you are probably interested in your career and know, know your stuff. Um, you have to literally not know what Bertie is or what ham piece to use. Um, I don't think you can really mess it up because there's, there's so many safety nets in place to make sure that you don't um, make mistakes. Yeah, and yeah. Um, as Ali was saying earlier, you're supported by um, your personal educational supervisor. And on, at the next level, there's like a, um, like a regional 
program director so there's there's not really a way of doing badly in it um yeah like I said, unless you don't know your stuff i don't know your stuff i mean like you can't even count teeth yeah i mean even even in that case you're still going to be supported so if you do if, if an educational supervisor feels like you're not completely up to scratch they're going to make sure that you are yeah, by the time yeah. they're done with you so they will literally say you are not seeing patients until you can prove to me that you can like do an impression announcement yeah and, and i know i know people they've done that too which is good because it actually gives you a bit of confidence because they, they teach you and they're kind of a lot of practices that i know actually get phantom heads as well now because of the whole covid thing so they'll teach you yeah, everything yeah, yeah. down to like prep all the way to to doing an impression forget anything else so you're always supported. It's never a problem. Um, and in terms of going to another... This, um, have you touched on this visa sponsorship thing? Because um, I remember... I think Chelsea's in here too, right? I think so. I'm not sure. Well, what's the deal at the moment with like Canadians and stuff that want to... So, so, oh yeah, this, this is important. So, if you're, change, right? so, yeah, so essentially, if you are a... Uh, foreign national so you're not a uk national anyone has the right to get a visa um as long as you can secure your job inside the uk so they've kind of there used to be a, a limit on how many they can give away and now it's kind of unlimited for the medical specialty or like anything healthcare based um so if you could get through the registration exam and you can secure yourself a job with a corporate or with the nhs directly they will sponsor your visa and usually they won't be many issues associated with that but then again getting the job in the first place will be the difficult thing That's the if you yeah i mean if you're on the dft program which you should be they sponsor your visa and i know plenty of people they've done that for there's a lot of canadian graduates uh, staying in the uk after they've graduated from uk universities and they're all being sponsored uh, without issues so yeah um, so i think and, i think and, i think that answers um debouche yeah um, yeah. Not any private clinic. So the the issue in the UK with private clinics is because because the general route is to always do NHS first. Um, private clinics are for like experienced clinicians. Um, so no no one really takes on fresh graduates to do private work because end of the day in the UK um, people go to a private dentist because they want like high quality work. I'm not, I'm not sure if that explains it, but the only way you're going to get a private job is if like you know someone and they're willing to take the risk with you. Mm. Or like myself, uh, my mum's a dentist. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean to be honest, like, um, you, you ideally you should be going NHS, like Brandon said, because you're not going to get any training for private. It right, just makes be lucky sense. if you do. It just makes sense because you're supported. Yeah. You can mess up more, as as bad yeah. as that sounds. Um, you know, end of the day, you need to practice, and the NHS is the place for that. Yeah, and there's also, uh, and just to go on to the next question about LDEC, um, require the ed LDEC for postgraduate training or other EU countries. So, so essentially, because Poland, unlike all the other European countries, Poland has been special. They've said on the E directive. Uh, that kind of gives you the gives your degree validity uh, within um, the EU block that they require um, one year postgraduate training and the LDEC to get your license in Poland um, or to meet the, the targets of directive. Now the targets of directive, if you look at it objectively, is literally just your dental education, nothing more than that. It's your five years of dentistry um, the syllabus that you have is good enough because if me and Brandon have been able to register with it, there is literally no issue. Um, but because Poland has added the LDEC and uh, the one year internship as the requirement on the directive, every EU country takes that as the the requirement to become a dentist in Poland, which is not true. But um, yeah, you need to do both if you want to work in the UK or you could go through the Portuguese route or you could take the LDS or RE. So there's three routes and all three of them have their pros and cons and it's up to you to choose which one would work better for you. Um, got another question. Brandon, the same's asking about... Um, note taking. Yeah. Note taking. So um, Ali mentioned how um, the UK likes guidelines and things. So the Royal College of Surgeons have 
some uh, guidance documents on their website if you go and have a look so it's got ones on uh, antimicrobial prescribing um and i believe it's called record taking or record record taking record keeping. Yeah. record keeping yeah so if you i think you guys can make like a free login or if not i can probably send some pdf over and it literally explains everything that you should be recording um and it tells you sort of what you should be recording for what situations and what's important and what's not so important so it has a good outline there so a lot of my um templates are based on that and also from my educational supervisors that I've had over the times. So I would recommend going on there and having a look. But I think Ali, we were saying in this course that we want to try and run for these guys, we're going to try and try and go over that. Yeah. I, I, we, we, um, Brandon basically had this idea where we hold a workshop, an in-person workshop where we do a uh, scenario based um, kind of clinical record taking uh, and kind of clinical, uh, sorry, what was the word for it? Um, examinations examinations yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then making your record based off of that and then presenting your findings to the audience type of thing which is i think that would be fantastic and we we, we still will go ahead with that we just need covid to, to go die somewhere um, nick okay I, what what things do you wish you could have done practice more during how's it poems you know what this 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 question about doing doing work at poems i think we all get so like worked up on it and we always want to do more so my advice is just get the most you can um as ali said towards the end of fifth year we all just sit at the back of the class and don't even want to see patients so um jump in and get as much as you can because once you start you're working on patients for real just little things like even um taking impressions I, I still don't think i'm good at doing impressions yeah same i'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still whack and um you think it doesn't matter but then i still remember in max Fax, so we're in the middle of an or um and it was a chap that had a half his magdala taken out and he needed an impression and there were four consultants standing there saying can you do the impression Oh God, man, the pressure. <laughs> yeah, so little things like that. Um, but that did not say a question, did it? What are the things you wish you had more of? Oh, me personally, uh, Prosto was pretty dead. Barely did like, I did like one person core for the whole. Prosto's like, huge. Yeah, Prosto. Literally 90%, not 90, but like 70% of your practice will be doing like Prosto work, like dentures and yeah inlays on lays and things so the thing is I like I, said, I i i wouldn't get too hung up on it because things change you learn as you go along and as long as you can hold a drill and do fillings and things you can do the rest yeah. of it um True. i wouldn't get too hung up on it even endo like we didn't mind i, I did uh all like uh file based um uh manual endo at uni and now we just do rotary which is completely different so i wouldn't get too hung up on that but Try and get as many hours as you can in those rooms, that's all. Yeah. And I mean, you always get courses and stuff that you want to go to uh, and pick up these skills anyway. So, you know, just learn all the basic competencies and everything in, in, in dental school and try to kind of get into the more difficult stuff while you can. And then if you don't accomplish everything you want to, you will accomplish it while you're in practice with all these courses and things that are available. Um, yeah. But... Um, the, the next question is what is the average salary of course money money is important uh you want to <laughs> you want to go about general practice because mine was unrealistic um so again it, it all depends what you do so if you're doing dft um i believe it's something like 32k that's yeah. not half of taxes that's before. That is, it's, it's 34 now uh and that's before tax so uh, you'd roughly be yeah, you'd roughly be taking what two grand, two thousand home for your first year, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I went straight into associate, and I got about, I think I hit like fifty or something. Yeah. But again, it, it all depends like where you live, and I was living out, so a lot of it went yeah. with expenses and traveling, and I, it just really yeah. varies. But 
if I would just work with um, if you're trying to work out in terms of whether it's viable, just work from that DFT salary. Um, uh, you do what Ali did. Yeah, mine mine was unrealistic though. I, I went straight into I got a locum job in oral maxillofacial surgery, and that was about eighty nine thousand. Uh, in my first year, which was pretty great uh, for a first salary, especially because yeah. I still didn't know I didn't know anything when I was going into it. But um, you can you can easily make that uh, actually more than that as a as a general dentist. But it takes yeah. a few years to get into. Yeah, it all depends on the position really and um, what you get. Yeah. Um, is there any more? Yeah. So there's there's other things, by the way, uh, uh, Hussein. If you're interested, um, what's what's that thing brand Cork Corku or something? You know the the AI based uh, note taking because I heard that's really great and it's covered Kuroku. all the guidelines. Yeah, there's Coroku. Yeah, Coroku. It's um, it's like a note taking um, web application. Yeah, it's, it's subscription based though, so you need to um, pay for it, I believe. Yeah, there's, there's lots good. of things out there. Lots of things out there. Um, yeah. I've got templates which I can send to you guys to have a look. I've got it. I've got templates for everything, and they've been like refined over the years. Yeah, um, those, those are the so, best templates. I think it also might be a good opportunity just to ask, what do people, in terms of this course that we'd like to run? Yeah, yeah, that's what a good do, idea. What do you guys want? What do you, what do you think that you're lacking, and what do you guys need help with? Yeah, because that that you know, Brannon and uh, Mohammed uh, Dastani is a bit Mohammed Modas uh, yeah, as well. So 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 these two have like very very comprehensive uh, um, kind of understanding of general dentistry now, especially with all the courses they've done. They've done like tons of courses as well, and uh, I've done a lot of. I had my experience is nearly all max wax, so I have like the surgical experience and things, but we literally want to help you guys so if you can tell us what what you want us to do um you should tell us now so we can kind of work on that uh no no there's no point doing uh ldec and ore i mean ldec would still be good but um if you're going to do the ore regardless there's no point doing ldec But that being said, um, keep an eye on the, uh, I'll post the, the, the information link as well on the, on the PowerPoint that we send out, because I'm going to add stuff to it, of course. Um, they might be changing things up. Right now, I just read that the General Medical Council, so the medical alternative to, to the Dental Council, is now accepting USMLE and NBDE, uh, M, sorry, USMLE, the Canadian one, the Australian one, and the New Zealand one as a direct entry, um, re not a requirement, but as a, the accepted method to get your license in the UK. So I would keep an eye, out on, an eye out on the General Dentistry Council website because they might do the same with the MBDE. Uh, so if you're an American student or a Canadian student who's done that, it might be an easier way for you to get in, but just keep an eye out for it just now. It, there's no guarantee that it would come up. But, yeah. Is anyone commenting what they want us to do? Oh. Uh, I think the whole whole thing, you know, this rule change with the, the GDC on how to license the UK has taken a lot out of people in terms of like their motivation mm -hmm. to go through. Because I, I would have been, I think you would have felt the same, like imagine having to go through all of that. But at the same time, it's not impossible. If you want to work as a dentistry and have a career in the UK, it's worth it. I would totally go through that route if I had to, to work here. So I guess there's no question. Yeah, it looks like that's it. Um, I wanted to ask uh, quickly, um, first of all, enjoyed the chat, uh, almost made me want to switch back, back to dentistry. Um, You'd be and, a shit um, dentist, <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. But um, I was wondering, like, um, especially in the MD side of things, we don't get nearly as much, I guess, practical training um, in our clinics. And I was wondering what the transition to being, like, uh, an independent clinician was like for you guys once you graduated. 
you guys have spoken about it a bit, but uh, um, yeah, I was wondering more, especially like in the OR when you have like the complex cases, what was that transition? Um, do, you, do you want to start with you, Ali? Yeah, I, I mean, it was difficult. Don't get me wrong. You're thrown, on my first day at work, I was on call. I was just given a deck phone, which is like a, a pager, which is a phone, let's put it that way. And they're like, you're on call. Um, and you're independent. Everything that you do, all the clinical decision making and everything um, that happens is on you. You've got support if you need it. You can call someone for help if you need it. But the transition was very, very hard at the start. And I'd always be messaging Brandon because Brandon also was in Max Hacks at a point in time. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? What am I supposed to do with that? So as long as you have like somebody that you can kind of speak to uh, about certain things, I think that transition was quite generally uh, easier to, to handle. However, if you don't network, if you don't build that support group with yourself, I can just imagine that would be incredibly difficult uh, to work as an independent um practitioner in a sense now kind of like after like a month a lot of graduates say this but I would you know being having gone through it myself a month into working um in any environment or any kind of uh specialty or field um you're kind of you you have the basic understanding of exactly what you need to do and you get you start building that confidence and then say after like four or five months you know at the end of my placement last year I was literally doing things with my eyes closed. So the transition is hard at the beginning. The initial shock is there, but it gets better over the, the course of time. Mm. Yeah, we'll bet you're yeah I, think, I think Ali, you know it on the head there. I, I personally like the um, thrown in the deep end uh, way of doing yeah. things. Um, the three main things that I've done since graduating, um, which was, so the first, which was general dentistry for about one and a half to two years and then the the dental core training position i did for a year in max Vax. and then now um which i'm i went back to general dentistry but effectively learning the business side of things i've been chucked into the deep end um each time and yes at first it seems really overwhelming um but you, the, the learning curve is just incredible yeah. um you 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 learn quickly. It's like if you do one filling, you aren't going to learn. But my first day of work, I had twenty five patients. Um, you just pick it up. Um, it is the it is the way to learn. You have to be tough. I think I think there is an element of that and be able to handle the stress. But I think everyone that does dentistry knows, you know, dentistry medicine knows that it is quite taxing um on the mind in that sense i think the fact that we survived that oral and maxillofacial year just explains it really because um yeah. they send you down to like the emergency department to like stitch up someone's face and then by the end of the year you're just doing sutures without even thinking about it yeah. as i said um, i mean i i remember my first tra i think i, I messaged you as my first trauma case and half the guy's face is gone. And I was just sitting there like, and I was, that was like 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm the only Max Fax doctor in the hospital. And I'm just sitting there like, what the hell am I supposed to do? What am I? What am I and then like, I think I talked to, to, to Brandon. Like I said, you need to have good support. And you will have good support, to, just even if you don't know anyone in the country. But, you know, kind of, you kind of systematically start going things. And, and as long as, that's why I was saying taking note, uh, note keeping is important. Not just because you're, you're doing good record keeping, but it forces your mind into a habit of thinking systemically and kind of uh, predetermining things as well. Like, this is what I need to do. This is my thought process. And actually in, in surgical speak, that's called sequencing. So in order, sequence, right? I admit, it, yeah, 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 in order. yeah. I think that yeah. that's, a, that's a big thing that I learned from the hospital was, um, yeah. you know, taking things systematically instead of just like jumping to a diagnosis. You like take yeah. a step back yeah. and okay. You know, you do yeah. medical history, social history, and like slowly go through it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, Ali mentioned about um, having mentors. So, 100%. I think a lot of people in the industry will tell you, like, you, the, the clinician you are, or what's the, what's the phrase you are who you like hang around with, like your, your five yeah. conscious people or whatever. So, yeah. who you hang around with is who you become. So, you know, 
I hang out with Ali. Um, so, you know, I get that influence from him. So if you hang around with like-minded people and people that want to learn and or support you, yeah. that, those transitions are a lot easier. It makes your life a whole lot easier in terms of like your career progression and everything. Because when you have one mind, it's just kind of you're thinking kind of like tunnel vision most of the time. But when you have an, another perspective, it literally is game changer for you. And that's important for dentistry and medicine. You always need to have like that objective thought or that other person that can kind of rationalize things with you. Does that answer your question, Sachin? I don't know. I feel like we always go off topic with these things. But... No, no, no. That was great. Uh, thank you. Yeah, the uh, uh, being in the OR and stuff was like very different for us. I not yeah. even know how to how to like put a scrub on first time. It's it's half getting shouted at and then half getting praised. I think. Yeah, yeah. You need to have um, thick skin, definitely. Very thick skin, because these consultants, they're, they're they, you remember they've got like over twenty years experience working in things, and what's basic to them is very new and very difficult to you. So if you're not like doing something properly or you're suturing like an idiot or you're kind of uh, drilling like an idiot, they're, they're, they are literally going to abuse you. But <laughs> I think that's just subjective based on the consultant. But at the same time, you need to kind of grow that thick skin and also understand why they feel that way because they're going to think it's basic. And remember, every single year, these guys are getting new trainees and they're starting from scratch every single year. I'd lose my mind if I, if I was in their position. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's very frustrating for them. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tony just... Lee's asked about LDEC. Um, LDEC resources, I never took it, but when I was um, vice president of DSA, I like fought very heavily to get things. I think we paid like for the translation of the LDEC 200 book, which yeah. should be on the um, DSA like Google Drive somewhere. Um, I, th I think people have got it. DSA still send it to people. Yeah, so I remember we got that when I was there. So um, I would recommend using that. But I think there's Facebook groups and all sorts now. Um, yeah, there, there's an app actually coming out in English. Uh, Abbas was telling me about it, which is yeah. like all old questions and everything just translated properly. Um, because LDEC apparently, well, I don't know about this. I don't know what you've heard, Brandon, but... Apparently, LDEC is like 70% old questions just recycled. And the past mark is 55%. So, Yeah, I'll be honest. I, I, I haven't looked into it ever since I found yeah. out my way of getting registration. I sort of yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> I jumped away from it. But the way I see it is like everyone who's in like fifth year and wants to do it, you guys should make like an LDEC society or whatever and just like hold sessions and run it. Um, yeah. And maybe even like find Polish students that are friendly enough to help you guys. Um. Yeah, LDEC. No, like yeah, I think it, okay. Yeah, like, that's that's yeah, the app, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think the book was like called L LDEC Not Two Hundred or something. So. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I think you guys should sort of team up and just um like hold sessions and study together. That's what I would do. And also advocate to the university. They do have resources to help you, so they need to kind of provide those to you. But if you're together as a group of students, then they're yeah, more likely yeah. to help you. We like we even got to a point where I think we were trying to split up like classes to with like Canadians and like elder people to teach us yeah. certain things. But as you know, as you guys know, it's all very difficult because you see, doesn't really have much power, does she? Yeah, she's the best dean, but still not. not yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I was going to say was, you know, in regards to people that are applying to the UK, like I think each um, year should have like a rep that's in charge of, because things are changing every year. Yeah. Um, in in my year, there was only like four of us that wanted to apply, um, mm -hmm. and because we had to get the syllabus together, I sort of took charge and said, okay, everyone get this syllabus. Yeah. Um. So similarly, I think each year should have like somebody that sort of coordinates and helps out. Mm -hmm. um, not because I don't want to help anyone but it keeps changing so like for example I think Ali knows more than me now about the process yeah um, and then I still, I, I still get messages from a lot of people um, about the, the process but it's changed so if you pass on that knowledge to that next person then everyone's got a really comprehensive understanding of it 
that's that's my other piece of advice really yeah that's um, definitely true you've got to work i mean i mean that's that's how it was for us when we were back the only reason i was able to register that easily was because of the information like brandon and uh to find and stuff passed on to me so we hope our hope is that that continues i mean now you have the um hashimi brothers to sort of set the the way so yeah um, does anyone have any other questions or anything they'd like to ask or any comments or anything that they, they, even if you've got feedback for us on what we can improve or what I could have improved in, in this uh, seminar? Because it is, it's something new for me anyway. So, uh, Just a question. When are you going to come teach at Poznan? And uh, will you be teaching me, perhaps? Oh, God, I really hope so. Um, yeah. I, I'm interested. What, what, um, what year is everyone? <laughs> yeah what 30, year are you now third year. third year what the hell man dude, I feel I know. do you remember my first day yeah dude you're it's you're three years you, you're on by. something i, no, I swear you were like day? twitching yeah my eyes yeah, yeah i know cocaine is, cocaine is. <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> and he was going about saying shalom to everyone <laughs> shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom. yo by the way yeah. question are you still in touch with uh that alex guy is he in canada again or where is he yeah, my friend Alex is in Canada at the moment. He's just like preparing for the exams. About the Canadian thing, there's a big delay in uh, in licensing at the moment. So yeah. people in my year who graduated are still um, suffering the effects of the Canadian system. It's br- Canadian system is worse than the Polish system, if I'm honest, in terms of like admin and organization. I think it's just, just as bad, yeah. I think every system has yeah. its flaws. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll read a similar thing here, I think. Yeah. I mean, Alex this is another Aclior, topic. Right? Sorry? Alex is in Aclior. Yeah, Aclior, yeah. yeah. The, uh, the other thing, by the way, I, I, I completely forgot to mention this. This isn't the UK, but uh, POMS uh, graduates can apply to Ireland for a license. The only problem with going to Ireland is getting a job. It's literally impossible. I only know one person who was able to get a, a job off the bat. And she was an exceptional case in the sense that she's a genius so <laughs> it's quite difficult but it's doable you can get a license without having to do the LDEC or anything of the sort in the Republic of Ireland. I think uh, Norway is it is the other one where everyone likes to go so yeah yeah again if you guys want like advice on that reach out to some alumni we definitely know some who are who are, yeah. who are out there so it might be worth if you guys want info on that. Yeah. Again, there's a lot of competition, a lot of people that don't want to help, so pick your advice yeah. properly. Yeah. No worries, Tony. Um, is that it then? Is Has nobody got anything else to add or anything? Because uh, we're going to escape. Uh, application process to Ireland. Okay, so just to quickly um, go over that. Now, it's all paper-based still in Ireland. There's a link. Uh, I can send that to you, Daniel, if you like. And on that link, you'll kind of reach this uh, this gateway kind of uh, application. You did basically have to download the paper application. You fill in all your details and everything. You can put your address as a country that you're from. So if you're from Canada, you put your Canadian address. It doesn't make a difference. They basically require uh, copies of your diploma in English and Polish. And they also want a letter called the Certificate of Conformity from the Chamber of Doctors and Dentists in Poland. And that basically says that your degree is, uh, your degree without the LDEC and everything is valid uh, as um, kind of like your final qualification. Um, and you do not need to, to do your license for you to use that degree in another country. It works for Ireland and Norway, but it doesn't work for a lot of other countries. I think it works for Sweden as well, I'm not sure. But for a lot of countries like the UK, Germany, Germany especially, they have the biggest problem with it. They won't accept that. But once you have that certificate, you've got your, your disclosure, which is like your police criminal background check. Um, you send all that paperwork to them. There's like an application fee. I can't remember how much it was. It was like, I think it was 24 euros I paid. Um, you send that away to them. You wait like two or three months and then they send you your license in the post. So very very easy way to license just takes a lot of time and you need to work out how you're going to get a job in ireland if you're an irish nation national then it's going to be much easier for sure uh, 
uh, surgical society is dead, is it not, Sachin? I remember you, you weren't doing anything. Can you set that up? We're, we're doing yeah. a bit here and there. Okay, okay, fair, fair enough. I'll have to, I'll have to check, check up and see how you're doing. Are you poaching my doctor, Sachin, in front of me? You're <laughs> poaching my connects in front of me. I'm gonna start a surf for very soon. I've always been my friend since before you got to Poznan, so I don't, I don't know who's poaching. He's my doctor. He's my connect. <laughs> yes, Sachin, you had your time. It's over now. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> He's ST1 now, so you can show you some... Oh yeah, I'm an ST1. I'm, S- I'm a registrar now, so I'm going to make you you do all the, the crap work, Sachin. I'm going to make uh, you clean the floors and clean yeah, the chairs. I have another question. Yeah. Uh, Portugal route, is it too late yeah. for me to apply for that uh, as a third year? Uh, no, so so the Portugal route, the way that works is that you finish POMS first um, yeah. and then you do a, a supplemental year in Portugal. It's like a, a master's type of uh, program. It's a, it's a private university though, so it's not a public institution, but it is registered in that country as a um, dental school which can provide diplomas which are recognized within the country. I'm sure, um, so you, can, I'm sure you can research into it. But um, yeah, yeah my, yeah, my understanding was the idea is you just join their fourth year. Sorry, join their fifth yeah. year. So fifth it, year, it effectively yeah. disregards your um, your degree. degree. Yeah. But the reality is you end up coming up with two degrees. <laughs> so yeah. my my closest friend actually actually did that. Yeah, um, and um, yeah, so I'm sure if you if you want to, you could. But I think if I was you, I would, I would finish poems first. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Because okay. then at least you have that one for sure, you know. Okay, sure. Could I message you um, about more detail? Um, about that, I think uh, Brandon's friend, and it was Navid. Um, yeah, Navid. It was kind Naveed. of yeah. Um, so uh, it's so, be able to help you with that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he, he he has a thing. I think right now um, Abbas is collecting names or something because they're going to do like an infer. Uh, well, uh, information thing or going to provide information on how to do it so I would just get in touch and you can add you to the email list or whatever it is that they're doing um, yeah Brandon when you're doing your up to takeover oh, dude I was meant to do it and they bloody cancelled yeah. on me yeah I know Eddie why do you keep cancelling he, he wants all he just wants all the, the famous people he thinks we're not famous I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it while I was in my Max Fax job. Um, yeah, I will definitely do one, guys. But once my workload yeah, sure. is um, manageable, yeah, of course, be fun to see stuff. Of course. Um, so I guess if there's going to be no questions in the next minute, we'll call call this uh, webinar to an end. Uh, I need to go shower and and actually. <laughs> do something with my life i literally finished work at like 12 o'clock i went for a dental checkup uh and then just woke up about an hour ago or just before this webinar <laughs> i think guys if you if there is anything that you guys want us to like teach you guys and help you help you guys out with please let someone know um yeah. i'm sure if you tell like obviously your dsa they'll pass it on yeah. yeah i think i'm still in the facebook groups and stuff so let us know. Is that okay then? Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to both of you for um, helping us out with this. It was really awesome. And um, if anyone has any questions for DSA, don't hesitate to like message us on Facebook or Instagram and uh, we'll help out with that. Thanks a lot for, for having us. Both. Right, thank you. It was good fun. Um, All right. IBSG will post this PowerPoint on our Facebook page, so just look up okay. for that as well. Yeah, I'm going to add quite a few things to it, just uh, links and stuff as well. That'll help. Thank you. No worries. Have okay. Bye-bye. You too. Take See care, you. guys. Bye.